Well, the first thing I want to do is to set up a theological context or a church context for uh, healthcare professionals like yourself and the ministry that you carry out in the name of the church. Um, the first is that if we look at sacred scripture, it is very, very clear that the miracles of Jesus uh, are indications of his concern for the sick and suffering of his own time. Uh, he cleansed lepers, he <clears throat> restored speech to the mute man, he cured a, women, a woman of chronic hemorrhaging, he brought a young girl back to life, and he cured, as you remember, <clears throat> Simon Peter's mother of a, of a desperate fever. So his public ministry, the public ministry of Christ, uh, integral to that ministry was uh, healing. And as Catholics, obviously, we believe that the salvific mission of Christ has been confided to the church that he founded and, uh, and built it on the, the, uh, the rock of Peter's faith. And so this, the salvific mission of Christ lives on in history through the ministry of the church and an integral part of the church's ministry for centuries has been the healing ministry. So we have to realize that in our Catholic healthcare systems today, the, the, what we do as healthcare professionals is rooted in the ministry of Jesus within the community of the church today. Historically, it was religious uh, women and men, sisters and brothers, and sometimes orders of priests, that their charism was to heal the sick. And they institutionalized this charism of healing in, uh, in their own order and in establishing the, what we know today as hospitals and places of, of care. And also within the history of the church, it has become the responsibility uh, and now, especially with the di diminution of the number of men and women religious, specifically those who are doing uh, health care, many of the orders who did have uh, hospitals or health care facilities, they've passed that on to, um, to lay people. And I'll say a brief, uh, if I have time this, at the end of the, my presentation, I'll talk what is being called jur uh, juridic persons that now sort of have assumed the charism that was originally exercised by religious men and women. So now, fundamentally, Catholic healthcare ministry is fundamentally a, a, a lay type of ministry. And also it has become a, a incumbent upon the bishops to take a very active role in the oversight of uh, healthcare ministry. No institution, according to church law, no institution in any diocese can assume the title Catholic. That an institution is, can call itself Catholic only when it has the permission of the local bishop. So a, when a new institution is set up in a diocese, they must petition the bishop to grant them the title of Catholic. And if things happen in the life of, of an institution which comes to the bishop's attention, that he also has to, the right, if the situation is not corrected, to remove the, uh, uh, remove the title of Catholic. Here at St. in um, the Diocese of Worcester, we have one Catholic hospital, St. Vincent's, here in the city. But it's an interesting type of phenomenon because it was, uh, it was begun by the Sisters of Providence from uh, out in the Diocese of Springfield. And for years, they um, ran that hospital. But they also had the support of the diocese. However, at one point, the sisters sold the hospital to, to uh, for-profit institutions. And it's sort of, they've been uh, sold and resold and sold again. So right now, St. Vincent's is atypical in terms of Catholic healthcare institutions because it's a for-profit uh, reality. But the hospital is run like a Catholic hospital, and there's where we have a, a covenant agreement between the Diocese of Worcester in the hospital. And if it comes to my attention, thanks be to God, it hasn't. I've been 14 years in the Diocese of Worcester this month. Uh, but if something were being done in the hospital that was that contravened church's moral teaching, specifically uh, Catholic uh, biomedical ethics, that I would notify the hospital. And they would have 30 days to respond to my notification to uh, correct the situation that, that has been judged uh, immoral. If they do not change that, that I would withdraw the Catholic title from the hospital and they would no longer uh, re representing the church in any way. So the bishop, and especially as these, and I'll say it a little bit at the end as I mentioned, as we, as Catholic institutions, Catholic medical institutions are partnering with non-Catholic um, uh, institutions, 
they become very, the, those merges and those partnerships become very complicated morally. And the bishop has to be very attentive to make sure that even if the partnership is deemed morally justifiable at its beginning, the bishop has to be attentive because sometimes these agreements are not lived out as it's supposed to be. So the point is, the um, present Catholic healthcare professionals work within the church context and are carrying out the work of the church in the work of Jesus. What I'd like to say, uh, the next, that's point number one. Point number two is to uh, point out to you some of the theological and moral principles that are interwoven throughout uh, the ethical and religious directives. These uh, directives that now are operative in, in the church in the United States, this, is, this booklet is in its fifth edition. And as a matter of fact, in the, I'm in the process, uh, for the last 19 years, as long as I've been a bishop, I have been on the doctrine committee of the USCCB, the National Bishops Conference. Uh, for the last four years, and I'm also the chair of the subcommittee on healthcare issues, for the last four years, we have been reviving, revising section six of this document, which has to do with mergers of Catholic and non-Catholic institutions. It's taken that long, the consultation uh, with professionals, uh, care institutions, with the Holy See, the Congregation of the Doctrine of Faith. So finally, we're, uh, my subcommittee is submitting to the body of bishops in June, we have a meeting in Florida, for uh, approval of that revision. So what, there are six parts to this particular document. Uh, the ERDs, we'll call them just for uh, uh, brevity's sake. But I'm only gonna look at sections four and five. Section four is uh, care for uh, uh, innocent life at the beginning of its uh, gestation and also look at end of life issues. So those are basically the two areas of my reflection. So what I'd like to do for the rest of this presentation is to point out to you some fundamental theological and moral theological positions. So first of all, that the most, fun, most fundamental theological insight in terms of uh, Catholic medical profession is that the human person created in the image and likeness of God is the being that is once corporal and spiritual. In the unity of the body, the, the soul and body relationship is so profound that one has to consider the soul to be the very form, the vivifying principle of, of the body. And we must remember also, according to Catholic doctrine, that although the act of creation is a partnership between God and the human uh, married couple, that, the, God, that the, the soul is not produced, obviously, by the marital act of the, of the, of the couple. The soul is created by God, and at the moment of fertilization, that soul is individually embodies and souls the, the, the developing body of the child, which will uh, vivify the whole human enterprise from birth, uh, from session to natural death. So um, it was a very interesting, if you followed, Pope Francis supposedly had a, con well, did have a conversation with a, a, a an Italian atheist named Scalfari, and according to Scalfari, <coughs> the Pope said that uh, there is no hell because souls that uh, have done evil just disappear. Well, obviously the Pope would not say that because the immort immor immortality of the soul is the fundamental dogmatic truth of the Catholic faith. So the, the soul produces through death, and then as we celebrate today in the Ascension, that Christ has taken our humanity into the life of the Trinity, and that at the moment of final judgment, our, our souls and our bodies which have decayed will, for those of, who are saved, will be united and we will enjoy the glorified life in heaven that uh, Christ and our Blessed Mother does at the present time. So those are some fundamental theological, theological principles. However, the church's ministry of healing the sick and curing uh, the ill is carried on at, at any particular moment in history within a particular context. And one of the great challenges to Catholic healthcare ministry nowadays is the ethical climate in which we find ourselves. And fundamentally, the ethical climate in Western culture, and specifically in the United States, is what is called ethical relativism. If you remember uh, that Pope Benedict XVI, I think it was the homily uh, right before the, uh, he was elected uh, successor of St. Peter, Bishop of Rome, he talked about a dictatorship of relativism. And if you talk to people, if you talk to 
uh, Mr. and Mrs. American Catholic, they are fundamentally ethical relativists, which creates a huge pastoral problem for the church because in our moral theology, we teach certain things that are called, uh, that we teach objective moral truth. And that is sort of enshrined in that we, we state very clearly that there are certain human acts that are intrinsically evil, which means to say the act is so vitiated uh, in its content that it breaks our relationship with God and sort of detours us on a pilgrimage home to our Father's house in heaven. And an, uh, an act that is uh, immoral and illicit, the intention of the actor and the circumstances within which the act performs the human act, intention and circumstances cannot turn an immoral act into a good act. But in the type of er ethical relativism that we face here in the United States in the Western culture are the following. One instance is pragmatism, which says if it works and is successful, it should be done. The second type of form of ethical relativism is consequentialism. The end justifies the means. A third type of ethical relativism is emotivism, which is to say right or wrong is determined by how deeply I, I feel it. That if, I, if I'm very worked up about something, that the correctness of the moral argument is determined by how passionately I argue the case. And you hear that all the time. As a matter of fact, in a society that's becoming more and more um, what is the word I'm searching for, is more and more crude in its discourse, the level of emotivism has reached a crescendo pitch. So it's in that type of uh, moral relativistic culture that the church is trying to carry out its mission to cure and to heal. So let's go right now to part four of the um, ERDs, which is entitled Issues in Care for the Beginning of Life. And again, this particular section, if you, if, if, are any of you uh, familiar with these ERDs? They're very, very important. And the form is that each section has an introductory narrative. And then that narrative is followed by a set of uh, uh, new uh, directives, which sort of implement in a very uh, pithy way what the narrative is talking about. So in section four, which has to do with uh, issues at the beginning of life, the following principles, moral principles, are repeated in the directives. First is the sanctity of human life at its beginning. The dignity of marriage in the marriage act by which human life is transmitted. And another very important insight in this, uh, the, the section on inter, uh, the beginnings of human life is what is technologically possible is not always morally right. And the literature is sometimes called the technological imperative. If it can be done technologically, it should be done. Making the decision at the using technologies at the beginning of life is very complex, and it takes a lot of serious moral reflection to decide whether this technology should be used or this technology should not be used. So first of all, um, one, one of the biggest uh, technological interventions at the beginning of life, as I'm sure you know, is for, uh, in vitro fertilization. Very, very common, very, very expensive. And our Catholic hospitals often are under tremendous pressure to carry out that technology. But unfortunately, in vitro fertilization is an intrinsically immoral act. Why? Because the Marriage Act, according to the church, our moral reflection, is that the Marriage Act has two related meanings. It has the unitive meaning which is the sharing of the life and love between the uh, married woman and the married man. That's the unitive uh, uh, dimension of the marital act. And the second uh, dimension of the marital act is the procreative, which this act engenders the gift of human life. Those two meanings cannot be deliberately separated. And if they are de de deliberately separated, through example, artificial means of, of contraception, it viscerates the moral act, and it becomes an immoral act. Now, and obviously, in vitro fertilization, that technology <coughs> sort of um, usurps the integrity of the mar marital act, and it can do so in at least two ways. And the ethical directives talk about uh, 
heterologous artificial fertilization, which is a reproductive technology that involves using the gametes for one or more donors. And that is prohibited because the act of conception, the act of fertilization is brought about outside of the body of the people who want to have a baby. And not only is, is it outside of the body, but the very gametes, the sperm and the ovum that are used to bring about new life, come from people, out, different people, and not the, uh, the, mother and the, the mother and father of the child. So heterologous in vitro fertilization is wrong because it undercuts uh, the unity of the, the marriage act. And also, there is another type of in vitro fertilization, which is called homologous artificial pro procreation. And this gamete, this technology uses at least one of the gametes of the couple. So for example, it's either the, the ovum comes from the woman or the sperm comes from the man who are in this relationship, but one of the other uh, gametes comes from a donor. So again, the integrity of the Marriage Act is undercut because of one of the gametes coming from someone outside of the love relationship. We are celebrating uh, uh, in this July, July 19, uh, 2018, it's the 50th anniversary of Pope Paul VI's prophetic document, Humanae Vitae, on the, uh, on the regulation of, of birth. If you remember, in 1968, when that document was um, produced and promulgated, a firestorm broke out in the Catholic Church. And it, it, it was especially intense here in the United States. Actually, some bishop conferences made public statements that sort of soft-pedaled the document. The American bishops uh, made a good statement uh, months after the, the, uh, the document, Mani Vitae. But if you read that document, it is, in fact, prophetic. And Pope Paul VI said, when the unitive and procreative acts are deliberately set, uh, separated, uh, either before, during, or after the marriage act, if that happens, that a, a flood of other types of immorality would come upon us. And that if you look at the state of the, uh, uh, in Western culture, uh, the state of sexual marital uh, realities, that it's, it's, it's the, the document proved prophetic that it has led to all to, in matter of fact, uh, this Me Too movement that's going on among but women who are coming forward to tell the horrific stories about uh, being sexually abused by powerful men, that I would dare say that this type of disrespect for women by men who feel that they have the sexual prowess to do what they want to do, I can, I, that's definitely in my mind, and I'm not the only one saying this, but I could see the relationship when when people can uh, express their sexuality without respect for uh, a, a loving reunion between a man and a woman, then the repercussions of the use of sexuality is very, very dangerous. And we're living with this aftermath. Just of the, uh, among our young people, this hookup culture, it is astounding. On college campus, campuses, it's just astounding the number of casual hookup relationships that happen uh, in a, on a college campus, even, sad to say, on our Catholic college campuses. So, so, so in vitro fertilization, which is very common, and is, a uh, matter of fact, in our Catholic institutions, for example, the Diocese of Worcester, uh, when Obamacare was, uh, was promulgated, we, had, we, had, we spent thousands of dollars with uh, legal fees in making sure that we could have insurance policies for, uh, for our lay people that did not cover uh, types of these types of medical uh, technologies that are, uh, are deemed by the church as immoral. Another technology that is <coughs> immoral is surrogate motherhood. When a, a woman, uh, the child is, is, is conceived, fertilized in vitro, and the fertilized ovum is placed in the, uh, the womb of someone who has come forward to bring the, the uh, ovum to gestation. Again, that is, although the, the, there's two uh, moral uh, evils involved there. One is in vitro fertilization, that's how the child is conceived, and then it is breaking uh, uh, the unitative dimension of, of, the, of the marriage acts that we either 
that to either go before or follow the, um, the birth of the child. So surrogate motherhood is, is prohibited. Now, there's another distinction that we have to make uh, in terms of caring for uh, life at its uh, vulnerable beginnings, and that is the distinction between a direct abortion and an indirect abortion. So let me read very uh, quickly uh, Directive 47, which very succinctly and very accurately describes the nature of a direct abortion. Uh, Directive 47, let me see here, yes. Directive 45 first. Abortion, that is the directly intended termination of pregnancy before vi viability or the directly intended destruction of a viable fetus is never permitted. Every procedure whose sole immediate effect is the termination of pregnancy before viability is an abortion, which in its moral context includes the interval between conception and implantation of the embryo. Health care institutions are not to provide abortion services, even based on the principle of material cooperation, which is a whole other lecture. Uh, in this context, Catholic health care institutions need to be concerned about the danger of scandal in any association with abortion providers. Um, there was a cause celebre out in a Catholic hospital in Phoenix, Arizona, where uh, run by uh, at least the, the uh, CEO was a sister, religious sister of mercy, where an abortion was performed. A woman had some, a very serious health condition uh, and the ethics committee of that Catholic hospital made the faulty decision that um, it was not a direct abortion. And actually, it came to the attention of the bishop, Bishop uh, Thomas Olmsted, who's a fine, fine bishop, and he said no. He's, his moral evaluation of the procedure was that it was a direct abortion. And the religious sisters of mercy was actually excommunicated because to, for someone to participate in a direct abortion, even performing it or giving consent for it, knowing that it's wrong, is, is excommunicated. Well, obviously, uh, the sister was eventually um, uh, reuni reunited with the church. But this is how seriously the church takes the act of direct abortion. But there are also instances of indirect abortion, the most common of which is a miscarriage. That's, in, in, this, that's in, in a real moral sense, a miscarriage is an indirect abortion. But there's also the classical um, exception or indication of an indirect abortion was in the ectopic pregnancy, when uh, the fertilized ovum does not attach itself to the uterine wall, but on the fallopian tube. And that can be, a, that, that reality can be a death dealing for the, uh, for the mother. So according to the church teaching, it's the, the principle of double effect, that the intention of the medical procedure is not to kill the child, e.g. an abortion, but the intention of the medical procedure is to save the mother's life uh, by, by excising the, the uh, part of the fallopian tube that has the, uh, the, uh, the uh, fertilized ovum. That is an indirect abortion because the intention is to save the life of the mother. That's the primary intention. The side effect, which is foreseen, we know that the child will die when the fallopian tube is up fallopian tube is operated upon. But the direct, uh, that was not the direct intention. It's a foreseen side effect. So what in fact is in one sense an abortion is an indirect abortion and can be morally justified if the, the principles are properly applied. Is everybody clear about the, so the distinction between a direct abortion, which is always in every war, it's an intrinsically immoral act, and an indirect abortion then in some cir circumstances can be justified. Let's see, all right. So why don't we move on to, um, let, let me just conclude by, uh, this conclusion to uh, my reflections on part four of the directives. Certain directives in this part four of the document addresses other techniques and, and technologies that are related to a Catholic institution's commitment to the protection and preservation of innocent human life. The provision of genetic and infertility counseling, which, which is, a great contribution that Catholic 
healthcare institution and ha Catholic healthcare professionals can provide uh, to couples who are suffering from in infertility. The promotion of adoption, uh, in a sense that we here in, the, in Massachusetts, that when um, same-sex marriage was um, legalized according to judicial fiat here in the Commonwealth, that one of the fallouts was um, our adoption agencies. That uh, the Archdiocese of Boston actually surrendered its license because it was going to be forced legally to place uh, uh, children, uh, adopted children, in a uh, same-sex marriage. So, so the archdiocese withdrew their, um, they just gave up doing uh, adoptions. Here in the Diocese of Worcester, I decided to no, we're not going to, we're not going to give up our license to carry out uh, um, adoptions, but also we will only do it according to the teaching of the church. We would not refer uh, adopted children to same-sex couple. Guess what happened? They stopped um, sending children to us. So we were forced out of the adoption uh, service because of this immoral activity that's going on. So, however, adoption is counseling couples uh, about adoption, I think, is a great service that Catholic healthcare ministry can carry it out. So those are just some reflections on the care of life at its vulnerable beginnings. Now let's go to section five of the, um, the healthcare the ERDs that deal with uh, death and dying. So let me just um, list for you some fundamental moral ethical principles that um, underpin the church's teaching on death and dying. The church in her moral teaching on the end of life issues witnesses to this fact, to the belief that God has created each person for eternal life, that God has given life and ultimately in a theological context, only God can take life from us in his t time and in his way. Another very in interesting principle also is this. Although recognizing the omnipotence of God and the sovereignty of God over human life, the duty to preserve life is not an absolute duty. It's interesting, I think there's a question here that raised that. What does that mean? It means that under certain circumstances, we can surrender our life for the ultimate good, which is God himself. And that, for example, martyrdom. Martyrdom is actually a free giving one's own life to witness to uh, ultimate truth. Pope uh, Francis, just a couple of months ago, uh, um, established another criterion for uh, sanct beatification and canonization, is that when someone, not in a sense of uh, martyrdom in an act of aggression by a per persecutor, but if someone gives his or her life in a type of devoted, lifelong service to someone else, that can be a criterion for sanctity and for canonization. So while life is a fundamental good, it's not an absolute good. And the task of medicine, as you all know as professionals, is to care even when it cannot cure. The use, the use of life-sustaining technology must be judged in light of the Christian meaning of life, suffering, and death. In this way, two extremes, two extremes that to be avoided when we're dealing with issues of death and dying. The first is we must um, talk about the classical distinction in Catholic moral theology, the difference between ordinary and extraordinary ma means of medical treatment. Sometimes in the literature it's called, it's called proportionate or disproportionate means of medical treatment. And in a nutshell, it's this, that a, a, a medical technology intervening at the end of life is deemed morally ordinary if the um, benefit that that technology will provide the dying patient, the, the uh, sick patient, if that uh, technology causes more benefit than burden, it is an ordinary means of medical treatment and must be used. Having said that, however, there's also the reality of disproportionate and extraordinary means of medical treatment, which is to say, if technical, technological intervention causes more burden than benefit, then A, and it's judged so uh, on, on sound moral grounds, A, that ordinary intervention, extraordinary intervention uh, does not have to be used. And if in fact, if that technology has been used, 
and it, it is then later de uh, deemed um, extraordinary, it can be removed. And that has become very, very um, controversial in the Catholic Church in the last 25 years or so, 30 years, uh, especially to do with artificial means of nutrition and hydration. However, right before he died in 2004, and I'll, I'll find that eventually, that John Paul II intervened and he, in, in two th March 20th, 2004, he made uh, the following intervention, a moral judgment on whether artificial means of nutrition and hydration are ordinary or extraordinary. And this is a very, very well done point of view. This is what the Holy Father said. <coughs> I should like particularly to underline how the administration of food and water, even when provided by artificial means, always represents a natural means of, pres of preserving life, not a medical act. But you remember that um, the distinction between ordinary and extraordinary means of medical treatment, that reflection <coughs> focuses on a particular medical act, a particular medical technology. The Holy Father goes on. Its use, furthermore, should be considered in principle, which is key, ordinary and proportionate, and as such morally obligatory insofar and until it is seen to have attained its proper finality, which in the present case consists in providing nourishment to the patient and alleviation of his suffering. That is a very dense but very um, brilliant summation of a moral evaluation of nutrition artificial nutrition and hydration. And the key is, the Holy Father is saying right up front that it is an ordinary means of treatment, in principle. And that simply means, that's, that's a, a flag to, to be aware that although in the ordinary cases it's to be used, there could be, there could be some instances when artificial to, uh, means of uh, nutrition and hydration could be removed because um, that as the Holy Father the finality of the act, which is to give people nourishment and to avoid suffering, if that intervention is not doing either of those, bring about those finalities, then the, the intervention can be uh, described morally as um, extraordinary. And this is how uh, we bishops have institutionalized that teaching in our directives in section five, which is, it, it's number 58. This is what we bishops have said. In principle, we start off with that. Uh, in principle, there is an obligation to provide patients with food and water, including medically assisted nutrition and hydration for those who cannot take food orally. This obligation extends to patients in chronic and presumably irreversible conditions, e.g. the pers persistent vegetative state who can reasonably be expected to live indefinitely if such care is given. Medically assisted nutrition and hydration become morally optional when they cannot reasonably, reasonably be expected to prolong life or when they would be excessively burdensome for the patient or would cause significant physical discomfort, for example, result, resulting from complications in the means employed. For instance, as a patient draws close to inevitable death, from an underlying progressive and fatal condition, certain measures to provide nutrition and hydration may become excessively burdensome and therefore not obligatory in light of their very limited ability to prolong life or to provide company. It's a very complex situation. What I say to my priest is when someone comes to the rectory looking for moral guidance on these types of very complex situations, I say to the priest, call me first because it, it's, it's, it can be very complex. And what is absolutely key is that in, in a, a death and dying issues vis-a-vis -vis Catholic moral theology, what is crucial is that the quality or the correctness of the moral judgment, whether something is extraordinary or uh, ordinary, the correctness of that moral judgment is rooted in uh, the best medical knowledge. And that is why in, uh, an attendant issue uh, for death and dying in the Catholic context uh, are durable powers of attorney. That for years we, the church has said that um, the, the durable power of attorney is the most morally acceptable type of uh, 
substituted judgment because the person who has this power of attorney, obviously the first consideration is that the patient is no longer uh, uh, medically and psychologically able to make reasonable decisions about his or her health care. When that state is reached, the person who has the power of attorney is able to speak to the physicians, to the nurses, to the professionals, and have an accurate account of what is this person dying? You know, is this, has the moment of fatality arrived? And within that context, you make a best moral decision. If you have uh, a living will that you make when you're 55 years old, uh, and you, you, don't, you don't want this, you don't want that, you don't want, you don't want the following, then it, it sort of, it opens the floodgates of very misinformed um, decisions at the end of life. And what has happened in some cases, when the uh, living will is given to the medical professional, that he or she, in a sense, becomes the arbiter of what is going to happen to that person. And it's a very, very um, difficult and perplexing situation. So well, I'm going to conclude this by just reading. Um, and if there are any questions, you can uh, ask them during the question answer uh, situation. That I want to conclude with words that the Holy Father um, issued to medical professionals during the uh, great Jubilee year. And this is the words that I, I make my own. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, I exhort you as men and women of science, responsible for the dignity of the medical profession, to guard jealously the principle according to which the true task of medicine is to cure if possible, always to care. As a pledge in support of this, your authentic humanitarian mission to give comfort and support to your suffering brothers and sisters, I remind you of the words of Jesus. Amen, I say to you, whatever you did to one of these, at least my brothers and sisters, you did to me. Thank you very much.